Swami Sardananda. As a garland maker picks many flowers of different colors and creates a beautiful wreath, so Sri Ramakrishna chose his disciples from the companions of previous divine incarnations and trained them to carry his message of religious harmony in this present age. On 23rd December 1885, Sri Ramakrishna remarked about Shashi and Sharat. In a vision, I saw that Shashi and Sharat had been among the followers of Christ, one pointing to his foremost disciple Peter, Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Later on, Peter's unshakable faith, indomitable energy, and unflinching love for his Lord gave a tremendous impetus to early Christianity. Just as Peter supported the early Christian church, Sharat carried the heavy responsibility of the young Ramakrishna movement for over 30 years. Sharat was completely unaware of his future role when, one day at Dakshineswar, Sri Ramakrishna sat upon his lap in an ecstatic mood and later explained to the curious devotees, I was testing how much weight he could bear to Sharat Chandra Chakrabarti was born in Calcutta at 6.32 p.m. on Saturday, 23rd December 1865. The house where he was born, 125 Amherst Street, was later demolished by the Calcutta Corporation in order to extend Harrison Road, now Mahatma Gandhi Road. His father, Girish Chandra Chakrabarti, and mother, Nilmani Devi, were devout Hindu Brahmans and quite well-to-do. They had a large family and were partners in Druggists Hall, a large foreign medicine pharmacy. 8. Sharat was very quiet and gentle, which was construed by some as signs that the boy was not intelligent. At an early age, observing his mother worshipping the family deity, he developed a strong religious inclination. At the age of 13, like all Brahman boys, he was invested with the sacred thread and he regularly practiced japam and meditation. He memorized many hymns about various gods and goddesses which he would recite to his young friends. Sharat was admitted to Albert School and later to Hare School. He was a good student and scored at the top of most of his school examinations. He took a leading role in his school's debating society and developed a strong body by exercising regularly and eating well. Sharat was born with a warm, loving and unselfish heart. He was extremely courteous and was incapable of using harsh words or of hurting anybody's feelings. His generosity was such that he saved his pocket money to help his poor classmates buy books, paper, pencils, and so on. Sometimes he would give his used clothes, sweaters, and shoes to his poor friends. Once he discovered that one of his neighbor's maidservants had been stricken with cholera and that her master, fearing contagion, had moved her up to the roof and left her to her fate. Sharat rushed to the dying woman and did what he could for her. When she died, he made all the necessary arrangements for her last rites. Shashi, a cousin of Sharat, was studying and living with Sharat's family. While they were in school, Shashi and Sharat were greatly influenced by the Brahmo leader Keshap Chandra Senator. They attended his services, studied the Brahmo Samaj literature and practiced meditation according to its tradition. In 1882, Sharat passed the entrance examination and then in 1883 he was admitted to St. Xavier's College. Father Lafint was then the principal of that college. Charmed by Sharat's deep interest in religion, the noble principal began to tutor him in the Bible and Christianity, in the company of Sri Ramakrishna. In October 1883, Kali Prasad, a mutual friend of Shashi and Sharat, read Keshab Chandra Sen's article about Sri Ramakrishna in the Indian Mirror. He suggested to his friends that they all visit this saint of Dakshineswar. All agreed. One afternoon the group of boys arrived at Dakshineswar and found the master seated on his small couch. He received them all with a smile and asked them to sit on the mat. He then asked their names and where they lived 
and was pleased to learn that they belonged to Keshav's Brahmo Samaj. At first sight, Sri Ramakrishna recognized Sharat and Shashi as his own. Sensing their spirit of renunciation, the Master said, Bricks and tiles, if burnt with the trademark on them, retain those marks forever. Similarly, you should enter the world after advancing a little in the path of spirituality. Then you will not sink in the mire of worldliness. But nowadays parents get their boys married while quite young and thus pave the way to their ruin. The boys come out of school to find themselves fathers of several children. So they run hither and thither in search of a job to maintain the family. With great difficulty perhaps they find one, but are hard-pressed to feed so many mouths with that small income. They become naturally anxious to earn money and therefore find little time to think of God. Then, sir, is it wrong to marry? Is it against the will of God? asked one of the boys. The master asked him to take a certain book down from the shelf and directed him to read a particular passage that quoted Christ's opinion of marriage, for there are some eunuchs, which were so born from their mother's womb, there are some eunuchs, which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive. The Master then asked him to read St. Paul. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Someone interrupted, saying, Do you mean to say, Sir, that marriage is against the will of God? And how can His creation go on if people cease to marry? Sri Ramakrishna smiled and said, don't worry about that. Those who wish to marry are at perfect liberty to do so. What I said just now was between ourselves. I speak on what I have got to say. You take as much of it as you like and no more. 3. Sri Ramakrishna set the fire of renunciation in the minds of Sharat and Shashi. When they were about to leave, the Master asked them to visit him alone. Sharat began to visit the master on a regular basis on Thursdays, a college holiday. On 26 November 1883, Sharat arrived at Dakshineswar by boat with two of his friends and found that the master was about to leave for Calcutta to attend the Brahmo festival at Mani Malik's house. Ramakrishna was pleased to see them and asked his attendant Baburam to give them the address so that they could attend the festival. Sharat wrote of the festival. We saw a wonderful scene. We felt that high waves of heavenly bliss were flowing in the room. All were completely lost in the Kirtan, devotional singing. They were laughing, crying and dancing. Some, unable to control themselves, fell on the ground. Overwhelmed with emotion, others acted like madmen. The master was dancing in the center of the God-intoxicated group, now rhythmically going forward with rapid steps and again going backward in a similar way. In whichever direction he would move, the people as if enchanted would make room for him. An extraordinary tenderness, sweetness and leonine strength were visible in every limb of the master's body and his face shone with a divine smile. It was a superb dance. In it there was no artificiality or affection, no jumping, no unnatural gestures or acrobatics. Nor was there seen any absence of control. Rather, one noticed in the master's dancing rhythmical and natural gestures and movements of limbs. It seemed as if an overflow of grace, bliss and sweetness surged from within like a big fish happily swimming all over a vast, clear lake, sometimes slowly and sometimes fast. It was as if the dance was the dynamic physical expression of the surge of the blissful ocean of Brahman, which the master was experiencing within. As he danced this way, sometimes he lost outward consciousness and sometimes his cloth fell. When that happened, 
someone would fasten it tightly around his waist. Again, if he saw someone lose normal consciousness, imbued with spiritual emotions, he would touch that person's chest and bring him back to consciousness. We felt a current of divine bliss emanating from the Master and spreading in all directions, making it possible for the devotees to see God face to face. Afterwards, the Master told all of us that one could attain supreme peace if one could raise the mind from sense objects to God. For one day at Dakshineswar, the Master was praising Ganesha, the God of success, for his great filial love and absolute purity of heart. Sharat was present in the audience. He said at once, Sir, I like the character of Ganesha very much. He is my ideal. No, the master immediately corrected him and said, Ganesha is not your ideal. Your ideal is Shiva. In you lie dormant the attributes of Shiva. Always think of yourself as Shiva and me as your Shakti, power, I am the ultimate repository of all your powers. 5. It is amazing how this mystical utterance of the Master was fulfilled later in Sharat's life. Sharat was tremendously attracted to the Master. Not only did he visit Ramakrishna regularly, but he also began to stay at night at Dakshineswar in order to practice spiritual disciplines under his guidance. The Master would awaken his young disciples at midnight and send them to different spots in the temple garden. Once Sharat could not concentrate and reported it to the Master. Immediately the Master pressed his index finger in between Sharat's eyebrows and his mind became calm like the flame of a lamp in a windless place. Six before coming to Dakshineswar, Sharat had met Narendra at a mutual friend's home in Calcutta without knowing who he was. Sharat's first impression was that Narendra was conceited and had bad manners. Later, during his second or third visit, Sharat heard the master praise a young man named Narendra so highly that he became interested in meeting him, not realizing this was the same person he had already met and disliked. Pointing to the young disciples, the master said, These boys are good. This boy has passed one and a half examinations. Sharat was preparing for his first arts examination. He is polite and calm. But I have not seen another boy like Narendra. He is as efficient in music, vocal and instrumental, as in the acquisition of knowledge, in conversation as well as in religious matters. He loses normal consciousness in meditation for whole nights. My Narendra is a coin with no alloy whatsoever, toss it up, and you hear the truest sound. He goes to the Brahmo Samaj also and sings devotional songs there, but he is not like other Brahmos. He is a true knower of Brahman. He sees light when he sits for meditation. Is it for nothing that I love Narendra so much? Curious, Sharat asked, Sir, where does Narendra live? The master replied, Narendra is a son of Vishwanath Datta of Simla, Calcutta 7. After returning to Calcutta, Sharat went to visit Narendra and was amazed to see the same boy whom he had previously met. From then on they became close friends. They visited each other and talked long hours about the master and spiritual life. Narendra told Sharat and Shashi about his experience with the master he is bestowing love, devotion, divine knowledge, liberation and whatever else one may desire on whomsoever he likes. Oh, what wonderful power! He can do anything he likes. 8. When the Master heard from Sharat about his meeting with Narendra and the development of their close friendship, he was overjoyed. He remarked in his homely way, a housewife knows which lid will go with which cooking pot. 9. One day Sri Ramakrishna became a Kalpatru, the wish-fulfilling tree, and fulfilled the wishes of his disciples. Some asked for devotion, some knowledge, and some liberation. Seeing Sharat silent, the Master asked him, How would you like to realize God? What divine vision do you prefer to see in meditation? Sharat replied, 
I do not want to see any particular form of God in meditation. I want to see Him in all beings. I do not like visions. The Master said with a smile, that is the last word in spiritual attainment. You cannot have it all at once. But I won't be satisfied with anything short of that, replied Sharat. I shall strive my best until I am able to attain it. At last the Master blessed him, saying, Yes, you will attain it. Then Sri Ramakrishna kept a vigilant eye on his disciples. Observing Sharat's spirit of non-attachment, the Master asked him, Whom do you love most of all? Well, sir, answered Sharat, I don't think I roy anyone. At this the master indignantly said, Oh, what a dry rascal! Fall either into one pit or the other, into the pit of filth or into the pit of gold, eleven, but who is foolish enough to want to fall into the pit of filth? If one has love in one's heart for one's fellow beings, one can easily divert it towards God. Once the master sang a Brahmo song to Sharat and told him, Assimilate any one of these ideas and you will reach the goal. The song runs as follows. Thou art my all in all, O Lord. The life of my life, the essence of essence, in the three worlds I have none else but thee to call my own. Thou art my peace, my joy, my hope, thou my support, my wealth, my glory, thou my wisdom and my strength. Thou art my home, my place of rest, my dearest friend, my next of kin, my present and my future, Thou, my heaven and my salvation. Thou art my scriptures, my commandments, Thou art my ever-gracious Guru, Thou the spring of my boundless bliss. Thou art the way, and Thou the goal, Thou the adorable one, O Lord. Thou art the mother tender-hearted, Thou the chastising father, Thou the creator and protector, Thou the helmsman who dost steer my craft across the sea of life. Twelve in 1885, Sharat passed the first arts examination. His father wanted him to study medicine so he could work with him at his pharmacy. Although Sharat had no interest in becoming a doctor or a pharmacist, he took Narendra's advice and enrolled in Calcutta Medical College. Sharat knew that the master would not accept food from the hands of lawyers or doctors. Moreover, the master was very fond of Sharat's sister's cooking and Sharat would carry the food she prepared for him to Dakshineswar. When the master learned about Sharat's admission to the medical college, he said clearly, If you become a doctor, I shall not be able to eat food from your hand. 13. Sharat was in a dilemma. But the ever gracious master removed it shortly afterwards. Sharat could not bear a casual, haphazard way of doing things. He was quite alert and methodical about everything, traits which he learned from the master. In 1885, Sharat went with the master to attend the festival at Panihati, which he recorded graphically in Sri Ramakrishna, the great master. After taking leave of the master, when Sharat reached the ferry that would take him back to Calcutta, he remembered that he had left his shoes near Ramakrishna's room. He immediately rushed back to pick them up. Learning the cause of his return, the master said, My boy, always remember things and never leave anything behind. All the fun and joy of attending the Panihati festival would have been marred if you had gone home and found that your shoes were missing and you did not know where you had left them. 14. Sharat bowed down to Sri Ramakrishna and as he was about to leave again, the master asked, How did you enjoy the day? It was a veritable fair of Hari's name. Wasn't it? Sharat agreed. Then the master praised the younger Narun. That dark complexioned boy has been visiting this place only for a short time, and already he is having ecstasies. He is a good boy. Please go to his house one day and talk to him. Will you? Sharat replied, But, sir, I like no one as much as I do the elder Narin Vivekananda, so I don't feel any inclination to visit the younger Narin. The master scolded him, saying, You, brat, 
are very one-sided. It is a sign of small-mindedness. As the flower tray of the Lord contains various kinds of flowers, so He has all kinds of devotees. It is a sign of narrowness if one cannot mix and have joy with all. You must one day visit the younger Narin. Won't you? Sharat promised to visit him and left. 15. After a few days, Sharat went to visit the younger Narin and had a wonderful conversation with him, which solved a great problem of his life. In passing, the younger Narun had said, Brother, whatever the Master asks us to do is for our good, otherwise, what self-interest does he have? Immediately Sharat realized why the Master had insisted that he visit the younger Narin. The Master's every word and action had some deep meaning. Sharat then gave up his study of medicine, so that he could serve the Master wholeheartedly. 16. After the Panihati festival, Sri Ramakrishna developed throat cancer. In September 1885, he had to move to Shampukur, Calcutta, for treatment. Some prominent doctors began treating him, and the young disciples, including Sharat, devoted themselves to nursing the Master under Narendra's leadership. The doctors cautioned the disciples that Ramakrishna's cancer would be aggravated if he talked often or merged frequently into Samadhi, so the disciples kept a vigilant watch over him. Nevertheless, one day the Master began to teach Sharat about meditation and posture. Sharat later wrote, Sitting in the lotus posture, placing the back of the right hand on the palm of the left hand and then raising both to the level of the chest, he said with his eyes closed, this is the best posture for all kinds of meditation on God with forms. Again seated in the same posture, he placed his right and left hands on his right and left knees respectively and touched the tips of the thumb and the index finger of each hand while the other fingers remained straightened. Then fixing his gaze between the eyebrows, he said, This is an excellent posture for meditation on the formless God. Saying so, the Master went into Samadhi. Shortly afterwards, he forcibly brought his mind to the normal plane of consciousness and said, I couldn't show you more. As soon as I sit in that way, the mind gets stimulated and becomes absorbed in Samadhi, and the air current moves upward and hits the wound of the throat. That is why the doctor advised me to avoid going into Samadhi. Sharat humbly said, Sir, why did you show me all those techniques? I didn't ask you. The master replied, That is true. But it is hard for me to remain quiet without telling and demonstrating some spiritual matters to you all. 17 Sharat was touched by the Master's infinite compassion for him. On 11th December 1885, Sri Ramakrishna had to move to the Koh Sipore Garden House, close to the Ganges. The air there was not polluted as it was in Calcutta. In the beginning, Sharat served the Master while staying at home, but later he moved to Koh Sipore. Sharat's father was alarmed. He felt that his son had been brainwashed by Sri Ramakrishna. He begged Sharat to be guided by their family guru, Jagmohan Tarkalankar, a famous pandit and tantric yogi. When Sharat did not respond, Girish hit upon another plan to bring his son back home. He went to Koh Sipore with Jagmohan, requesting him beforehand to ask some difficult, esoteric questions of Sri Ramakrishna in front of Sharat. He thought that if the Master could not answer those questions, Sharat would come back to his senses and return home. But the result was the reverse. After talking briefly, Jagmohan realized the greatness of the Master and told Girish privately, I will never advise Sharat to give up such a Guru. 18. Girish's hopes were dashed, but he still did not give up. He thought that perhaps marriage could bind Sharat to the world. Another day he went to Koh Sipore and told Sri Ramakrishna, Sir, if you ask Sharat to marry, he will. Immediately Sharat said, Do you think I shall obey if the Master asks me to marry? In no way shall I deviate from my duty, 
even if the master requests me to do so. Ramakrishna said to Girish with a smile, Did you hear what Sharat says? What else can I do? 19 once Sri Ramakrishna remarked, Mahamaya does not trap those who are around me. Sharat was the eldest son and the center of his family's attention because of his maturity and intelligence and his loving and steady nature. Gradually Sharat's mother and brothers became devotees of the master and visited him in Kossipore. One day Charu Chandra, one of Sharat's younger brothers, came to see the master. Ramakrishna was pleased to meet the boy. He is a fine boy, said the master to Sharat, a little more intelligent than you. Let me see if he has good or bad tendencies. So saying, he took Charu's right hand into his own and weighing it said, Yes, he has good tendencies. He then asked Sharat, Shall I draw him? That is, draw his mind away from the world and turn it towards God. Dot. What do you say? Sharat replied, Yes, sir, please do so. Sri Ramakrishna thought for a while and said, No, no more. I have taken one, and if I take this one also, your parents, especially your mother, will be very grieved. I have displeased many a Shakti, woman, in my life. No more now, twenty in spite of his illness, the master gave Charu some spiritual instructions and told him that intelligence is the right one which helps one to realize God. And that intelligence is inferior which brings worldly prosperity. 21. He asked his attendant to give the boy some refreshments and send him back home. Day and night in Kos Sipore Sharat witnessed the final divine play of Sri Ramakrishna. On 1st January 1886, the master went for his last walk in the garden and again became a Kalpatru, wish-fulfilling tree. He blessed many devotees, saying, Be illumined. Sharat and Latu were then busy cleaning the master's room but saw that historic event from the roof. Later when somebody asked Sharat why he did not go to the master for blessings, he replied, I did not feel any necessity for that. Why should I? Was not the master dearer than the dearest to me? Then, what doubt was there that he would give me, of his own accord, Anything that I needed, twenty to some time in the middle of January, the elder Gopal wanted to distribute twelve pieces of ochre cloth and twelve rosaries to some monks. Pointing to his young disciples, the master said to him, You won't find better monks than these. Give your cloths and rosaries to them. Instead, Gopal offered them to the master and he himself distributed them among his young disciples. Sharat received an ochre cloth, the garb of a monk, from the master. With a view to teaching them to rely on God and to purge pride from their minds, one day the master asked the disciples to beg food from door to door like traditional monks. Later Sharat told one funny incident. When he appeared in front of a house and asked for alms, an old lady came out and indignantly said to him, You have such a strong body. Why are you living on alms? Can you not get a job as a tram conductor? Saying so, she shut the door. 23 days of austerity and travelling after Sri Ramakrishna's passing away on 16th August 1886, the disciples had to return to their respective homes. Sharat's parents were happy to have him back, but his mind was not at home. He could not succeed in concentrating on his studies. The blissful form of the master appeared in his mind and he cried when he was alone. However, within a couple of months, the Ramakrishna monastery was established at Barnagore with the generous help of Surindramitra. Sharat began to visit the monastery off and on, sometimes spending the night. His father advised him to put his mind on his studies but it was to no avail. Then Sharat's desperate father locked him in a room. As an obstructed river flows more vigorously, so this confinement increased his renunciation and longing. 
The unperturbed Sharat was waiting for a call from the master. One day his younger brother Prakash furtively unlocked the room, Sharat silently walked out of the house and went straight to the monastery. During December 1886, Sharat and some other disciples went to Antpur, the country home of Baburam. Inspired by Narendra, they took informal vows of monasticism during a night-long vigil around a sacred fire. Later they discovered that their vigil had taken place on Christmas Eve. A month later they took formal monastic vows through the Virajahoma ceremony in Barnagore. Narendra gave the name Swami Sardananda to Sharat. During this period Sardananda's parents, sensing that he had gone beyond their recall, visited Barnagore to give him their blessings. God makes everything favourable for one who loves Him. After cutting all family ties, Sardananda became absorbed in spiritual disciplines. Sometimes Vivekananda and Sardananda would spend the whole night in Japam and meditation at the Kosipore cremation ground where the master's body had been cremated. Also Sardananda would sometimes go to Dakshineswar and practice sadhana in the Panchavati grove. On 9th April 1887 Vivekananda said to M. The Master has given me charge of Sharat. Sharat is now yearning for God. The Kundalini is awakened in him. Twenty-four luxury and comforts are obstacles to spiritual life because they invariably prevent the aspirant from moving forward. Poverty and struggle act as friends. The disciples of the Master faced dire poverty in the monastery. They had very little food to eat and sometimes they starved. However, the Master had given them a taste of divine bliss, which helped them to transcend physical sufferings. In the monastery, everybody carried out their respective responsibilities. Sardananda would help with the household duties, such as cleaning the rooms, washing the dishes, and so on. Sardananda learned from Viveke and the how to sing and play drums, tabla, and he had a sweet, melodious voice which from a distance could be mistaken for that of a woman. One night, while Sardananda was singing, some young neighbours thought they were hearing a woman's voice. With a view to exposing the monks' hypocrisy, they scaled the boundary wall and entered the monastery. After discovering the truth, they were ashamed and sincerely apologised to the monks. When Sardananda would recite the Chandi, the glory of the Divine Mother and other hymns with His melodious voice, even bystanders felt spiritually uplifted. Even in advanced age, He would sing one or two devotional songs on the occasion of the Master's or Swamiji's birthday. After Sri Ramakrishna's birthday in March 1887, Sardananda went with Premananda and Abhedananda on a pilgrimage to Puri, a place sacred to Jagannath, Krishna. At that time there was no railroad to Puri, so they walked 300 miles. They stayed six months at the Emer Monastery in Puri and practiced austerities. They regularly visited the Jagannath Temple and attended the famous chariot festival. Sardananda later reminisced, I would look at the image of Chaitanya without blinking. The sea view would make my mind limitless. Sitting on the sea coast at Swargadwara, I would spend the night fearlessly. I lived by begging food from Anondo Bazar, the temple food market. Dot 25. When Sardananda returned to Barnagore after this pilgrimage, he became more indrawn, his body was emaciated, and his face was aglow with devotion. During this period, the disciples were restless to achieve the highest spiritual experiences. So they travelled to various holy places of India and from time to time they would return to the monastery for a break. Probably in the fall of 1889, Sardananda left for a pilgrimage with Vakunthanath Sanyal, a householder disciple of the Master. First they visited the Vishnu temple of Gaya and then Bodh Gaya, where Buddha attained illumination. From Gaya, Sardananda and Vakuntha reached Varanasi, the abode of Lord Shiva and became the guest of Pramdadas Mitra, a rich devotee and a famous Sanskrit scholar. 
Within a week they visited the important shrines of Varanasi and then left for Ayodhya, the birthplace of Ramchandra. Afterwards they went to Hardwar and Rishikesh, in the foothills of the Himalayas, two of the most important places for ascetics. On 31st December 1889 Sardananda wrote to Pramdadas from Rishikesh. It is a beautiful place. The mountain stands on its north and east sides and below flows the Ganges. It seems this place is the meeting point of heaven and earth. It is said that once the great sage Vyasa practiced austerity here with 60,000 disciples. I heard that some holy people live here, but so far I have not seen an exalted one. Truly speaking, after seeing the Master, our eyes are spoiled. We have never seen that spirituality in any place, and we don't expect to either. 26 As the climate was good and food was available, Sardananda continued his sadhana in Rishikesh. One day he told Vakuntha, by the grace of the Master henceforth, I have separated myself from the mind. The vagaries of the mind will not be able to delude me any more. I am, as it were, the witness, 27 on the day of Shivratri, the spring festival of the Lord Shiva, Sardananda and Turiyananda went to visit Nilkanteshwar Shiva, 16 miles from Rishikesh. It was on a remote hill in a jungle full of ferocious animals. On their way back that evening they lost their way. They decided to take two separate routes, so that both lives would not be endangered at once. Luckily, Turiyananda reached a solitary ashrama, and the next morning he and another monk went out to locate Sardananda. After a long search they saw him meditating, seated on a piece of rock. When he was asked why he did not try to find shelter, Sardananda replied, When death is certain, it is better to die chanting God's name without being anxious. 28 On 12th April 1890 Sardananda, Turiyananda and Vakuntha left Rishikesh for Gangotri, the source of the Ganges, Kedar and Badri, three important holy places located in the interior part of the Himalayas at high altitudes. Each Swami carried two blankets, personal clothing, one stick, and no money. They began their journey barefoot on the trail. At that time, travelling in the Himalayas was not only very difficult but also dangerous. Some days they had to go without food and some days without shelter. However, this pilgrimage was full of thrilling experiences for them. On the fourth day Sardananda developed a blister on one foot and it became difficult for him to walk. He asked his companions to reach the nearest village before evening and try to get help for him while he waited for them by the side of the road. When they left, Sardananda began to twenty-one crawl towards the village. In the meantime, the workers of Kalikamli Baba's ashrama who provided free food to mendicants, were carrying food on their horses along that same road. They put Sardananda on a horse and dropped him off at the nearest village. Sardananda arrived just as Turiyananda and Vakuntha were planning to rescue him. All were happy and realized the grace of the Master. They stayed in the village temple for three days while Sardananda recovered. At last they reached Gangotri and stayed three days at Kalikamli Baba's ashrama. From Gangotri they wanted to take a shortcut to Kedar, but they did not know the way. So they hired a guide, offering him a cloth as payment, since they had no money. The guide went with them for a distance and then disappeared. They walked for three days along the jungle path without food. Turiyananda ate some soft leaves and began to vomit. In the afternoon there was rain, they could do nothing but sit helplessly for meditation under the sky, covering their bodies with blankets. By the grace of the master, the rain stopped within ten minutes and they reached a farmer's cottage. The next morning they followed a group of hill people who were going in the same direction. 
Suryananda and Vakuntha went first and Sardananda followed them. While walking down a one-mile slope, Sardananda saw an old woman who was losing her balance because she did not have a walking stick. He gave his own stick to her, risking his life. When they reached the bottom of the slope, Turiyananda noticed that Sardananda had no walking stick and he was told that it had been given away to an old woman. The local group changed direction, but Sardananda and his party continued their journey towards Kedarnath. On their way they crossed a small stream with a terrible current. While crossing Sardananda fell into the stream and immediately Turiyananda and Vakuntha extended their sticks to rescue him. Then they reached a village, Bureau Kedar, and that night got a full meal from the villagers. Finally, after passing through all these hardships, Sardananda wanted to test whether the master was with him or not. He thought, if anyone feeds me luchi, fried bread, and haluya, farina pudding, tomorrow, I shall believe that the master is with me. The next morning Sardananda went alone, to visit the village marketplace. All of a sudden, a shopkeeper called to him, Hello, holy man, have some refreshment. Sardananda replied, I have two more companions. Please give me whatever you want and I shall share with them. No, you eat first, said the shopkeeper. I shall arrange for them later. The shopkeeper then served him hot fried bread and farina pudding. When Sardananda asked for food for his companions, the man refused to give any more. Sardananda told the whole story to Turiyananda and Vakuntha and knew without a doubt that the master was with him. 29 From this village, Turiyananda left alone for Rajpur in the foothills of Masri to practice austerities. Sardananda and Vakuntha visited Kedarnath on 4th May 1890 then Tunganath and Badrinath and finally Almora. After arriving at Almora on 12th August 1890, Sardananda wrote a detailed letter to Pramdadas about their journey. At Tunganath they had passed sleepless nights because of the cold. It snowed on them in Kedarnath and the panoramic view and the perpetual snow range of the Himalayas charmed them. In Badrinath they bathed in the hot springs and visited the cave of the sage Vyasa where he had compiled the Vedas. Sardananda met Vivekananda and Akhandananda at Almora and then on 5th September they all left for another journey towards Gadhwal. Akhandananda had a high fever and bronchitis and a doctor advised him to go down to the plains. So the brother disciples arranged for Akhandananda's treatment at Dehradun and then left for Rishikesh to practice austerities. Later Sardananda and others met Akhandananda at Merit and stayed there for several weeks. In February 1891 Sardananda unexpectedly met Swamiji at Delhi. Then after visiting Itava, Mathura, Vrindavan and Prayag, Sardananda and Vakuntha reached Varanasi in April 1891. In Varanasi they continued their sadhana and lived on alms. During this time, Dinu or Dinanath, an earnest elderly devotee, came to Varanasi in search of a guru. He was so impressed by Sardananda that he took sannyasa vows from him and became Swami Satchidananda. Sometime in June, Sardananda, Abhedananda and Satchidananda circumambulated the holy city Varanasi as an austerity. Eventually they all became sick. Sardananda first got a fever and then was attacked by dysentery. He was nursed by Satchidananda. During this pilgrimage he always carried a picture of Sri Ramakrishna which he gave to Satchidananda. Finally, in September 1891, Sardananda returned to the Barnagore Monastery. After recuperating from dysentery, Sardananda went to Jairambati, the birthplace of Holy Mother, to attend the Jagadatri worship. He stayed there a few weeks and contracted malaria. He suffered a long time even after returning to Barnagore. In 1892, the Ramakrishna monastery was moved from Barnagore to Alambajar. 
क्लोज टू द दक्षिणेश्वर टेम्पल गार्डन सरदानंदा डिसाइडेड टू परफॉर्म सम साधना एट द पंचवती वेयर द मास्टर हैड प्रैक्टिस्ड वेरियस काइंड्स ऑफ डिसिप्लिन लेटर सरदानंदा रेमिनिस्ट आई वुड बेग फॉर अनकुक्ड फूड फ्रॉम दक्षिणेश्वर विलेज एंड कुक इट माई सेल्फ इन एन अर्दन पॉट ऑफरिंग इट टू द मास्टर आई वुड ईट वंस अ डे एंड प्रैक्टिस जपम एंड मेडिटेशन डे एंड नाइट थर्टी इन एटीन नाइंटी थ्री विवेकानंदा रिप्रेजेंटेड हिंदुइज्म एट द पार्लियामेंट ऑफ रिलीजन्स इन शिकागो एंड द न्यूज ऑफ हिज सक्सेस रीच्ड द ब्रदर्स एट अलम्बजर सरदानंदा अगेन लेफ्ट फॉर पिलग्रमेज दिस टाइम टू वेस्ट इंडिया एंड विजिटेड जयपुर पुष्कर माउंट अबू द्वारका प्रभास जूनागढ़ एंड चित्तौर आफ्टर रिटर्निंग फ्रॉम द पिलग्रमेज ही नर्स्ट अभेदानंदा who was seriously ill from a severe infection in his feet abedananda recuperated after 3 months under sardananda's care sardananda also took care of yageshwar bhattacharya a householder devotee of the master who was dying from tuberculosis forgetting himself sardananda served everyone throughout his life like a loving mother a person becomes great through his actions dedication unselfishness and self control one day sardananda saw muddy footprints on the floor of the shrine at alambazar monastery he learned that the cook had made them and he called for him loudly as if he were going to burst with fury as soon as the cook appeared sardananda controlled his temper and calmly said you can go 31 in Europe and America after spreading the message of Vedanta in America and England for several years Vivekananda desperately needed an assistant to continue the momentum He wrote Sardananda and asked him to come to England In the beginning Sardananda was reluctant but then he went to Holy Mother and sought her advice The mother told him My son be not afraid You should go to the west The master will protect you and will be with you wherever you go. Thirty-two in March, eighteen ninety-six, Sardananda left for England and arrived there on first April. On the way, his ship was buffeted by a hurricane in the Mediterranean Sea. All the passengers were in a great panic. The Swami recalled, some were crying, some were running here and there in fear, some were shaking out of nervousness. The whole scene was frightening but I was not afraid in the least My mind was as steady and calm as the needle of a compass 33 when the ship stopped at Rome he went to visit St Peter's Cathedral Standing in front of the sanctuary his mind became absorbed in his previous incarnation and he lost outer consciousness for some time Ramakrishna had said that he and Shashi had previously been companions of Christ. In London Sardananda was the guest of Mr E T Sturdy a Vedanta student. Vivekananda arrived there at the end of April. The two swamis had not seen each other for a long time. Sardananda told Vivekananda all the news of their brother disciples at the Alambazar monastery and of their activities in India. It was a most happy occasion. From May 1896 Vivekananda began his whirlwind activity in London, five classes a week, janana yoga lectures on Sundays and meeting new people. Sardananda attended Swami ji's lectures and learned how to lecture in the West as he had no previous experience in public lecturing. In London, at Swami ji's behest, he gave some classes on the Gita. His first task was to supply materials about the life of Sri Ramakrishna to Professor Max Muller, the famous German orientalist. Years later, Sardananda recalled, "At the invitation of Max Muller, Swami ji went to Oxford and stayed in his home as a guest. Max Muller wrote an article in the 19th century on Sri Ramakrishna entitled A Real Mahatma." He asked Swami ji to furnish him with enough material for a book so he could write about Sri Ramakrishna in greater detail. Swami ji agreed to help. When he returned, he asked me to undertake the job forthwith. 
I worked hard and gathered all the incidents in the life of the Master and the teachings of the Master and showed the manuscript to Swamiji. I thought Swamiji would edit it and make extensive corrections. He didn't do that. He simply changed a few words for fear of exaggeration and sent the whole manuscript to Professor Muller. As I remember, Professor Muller incorporated the complete manuscript in his book, The Life and Sayings of Sri Ramakrishna, and published it without making any alterations. 34 Vivekananda established the Vedanta Society of New York in 1894. Towards the end of June 1896, he asked Sardananda to go to America with J. J. Goodwin, his English disciple and stenographer, to carry on the Vedanta work. Sardananda was nervous about lecturing, but Swamiji encouraged him, Look, I have already lectured there. You just teach them a little Gita and Upanishad and answer their questions. That is all. After arriving in New York, Sardananda was introduced by the president of the Vedanta Society and gave his first talk. While Sardananda was lecturing, Goodwin sat in the back, laughing. This made the Swami nervous, thinking that he was not lecturing well. When the lecture was over, he asked Goodwin why he was laughing. You were speaking well, answered Goodwin, that's why I was laughing, 35 Sardananda's sweet and gentle personality and his masterly exposition of the Vedanta philosophy proved attractive at once. He was invited to be one of the speakers at the Green Acre Conference of Comparative Religions in Mane, where he lectured on Vedanta and held classes on yoga. After the sessions closed, Sardananda lectured in Brooklyn, New York and Boston. At the Brooklyn Ethical Association, he lectured on the ethical ideas of the Hindus. Everywhere Sardananda went, he made friends and won staunch followers of Vedanta. Finally, he settled down in New York to carry on the Vedanta work in an organized way. Once in New York, a woman sought the Swami's help regarding some terrible psychic experiences. At night, the furniture of her room moved around, the windows flew open, she felt an unknown presence and some formless being lifted her body a few inches off the floor. After reflecting a few moments, Sardananda said, I am glad you have come. But if you ask my opinion, I will say that these experiences are the result of a weakened state of mind. Please train your mind firmly to think thoughts that are wholesome, good and beneficial. By invigorating thoughts alone, these occult phenomena and psychic experiences can be averted. 36. The Swami gave her some spiritual instructions and asked her to meditate daily and read inspiring books. This eventually solved her problems. Sardananda had a wonderful sense of humor. Once the Swami was staying as a guest at Ridgely Manor, the country home of Mr. Francis Leggett, then president of the Vedanta Society. Every morning Miss Josephine MacLeod, Mr. Leggett's sister-in-law, would ask the Swami, Did you sleep well? It so happened that one Sunday while Sardananda was lecturing, Miss MacLeod fell asleep. Then, while shaking hands after the lecture, he asked, Did you sleep well? Both laughed heartily. Sardananda used to hold classes regularly in Montclair, New Jersey, where he would stay at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Wheeler. Swami Atulananda, a Western monk, wrote in his book with the Swamis in America. An interesting incident took place when Swami Sardananda was living at this happy home. The Swami had often spoken about Sri Ramakrishna and one day he produced his master's photograph and showed it to the lady of the house. Oh, Swami, she exclaimed, it is the same face. What do you mean, said the Swami. And then she told him that long ago, in her youth, before she was married, she had had a vision of a Hindu and that it was the same face that now she saw in the photograph. It was Sri Ramakrishna, she said, 
but I did not know it until now. I was so much impressed and charmed at the vision at the time that I remember the face very distinctly and I have been going about here and there ever since I had the vision wherever I heard that a Hindu had come to America but I was always disappointed not finding the same face. And now at last I see that it was Sri Ramakrishna, 37 referring to this incident, Sardananda later recalled, the Master chooses his own men and women, we are mere instruments in his hands. It is a privilege to work under his banner. In America he had already prepared the ground for me, I was not alone. He brought to me men and women of exalted character who helped me in our work and bore great love for our master, 38 Mrs. Ole Bull of Boston, who immensely helped Vivekananda's Vedanta work in the West, invited Sardananda to her home. She also introduced the Swami to her influential friends, such as Professor William James and other academics at Harvard University. Mrs. Bull often said that Swamiji was like the brilliant scorching sun and Sardananda, the cool, refreshing moon. Sardananda lectured at the Free Religious Association in Boston on Sympathy of Religions. He lectured at the Cambridge Conferences also. It is a great loss that only one of the Swami's lectures was recorded, the Vedanta, its theory and practice. Dr. Louis G. James director of the Cambridge Conferences, wrote to the editor of the Brahmavadin in appreciation of Sardananda's work. In Cambridge, the classes in the Vedanta philosophy, constituting a single feature in the broad field of comparative study outlined for the Cambridge Conferences, attracted large and intelligent audiences, in part made up of professors and students of Harvard University. The Swami's exposition of the principles of the Advaita doctrine, in just comparison with other views which are held in India, was admirably lucid and clear. His replies to questions were always ready and satisfactory. In Boston, Waltham and Worcester, Massachusetts, Swami Sardananda conducted a series of lectures which were largely attended and which everywhere manifested a sustained interest in his subject. 39 Just at this time when Sardananda was at the height of his usefulness in America, Vivekananda recalled him to India to help him organize the Ramakrishna mission at Belur. After having stayed two and a half years in America, he sailed with Mrs. Ole Bull and Miss MacLeod for India on 12th January 1898, handing over the responsibility of the Vedanta Society to Abhidananda. Sardananda reached London on 20th January and Paris on 21st January. He admired the art, music and other creative talents of the French people. The following are a few entries from his diary. Saturday, 22nd January 1898, Paris, the theatre, Sarah Bernhardt as the blind wife, La Belle Paris, the artistic in French life, the Notre Dame, Theatre Renaissance, La Villa Mort. Sunday, 23rd January 1898, left Paris at 8 p.m. In the train from Paris to Naples. Madeleine Church. Acquaintance with Mr. Niblack, the American Embassy. A ride off two nights and one day to Rome from Paris. Tuesday, 25th January 1898, arrival at Rome early in the morning. The Hotel Continental St. Peter View from the top of the Mount Janiculum The Catacomb of St. Sebastian The Theatre at Night Signora Eleonora Duz, the Great Actress Santa Scola, the Sistine Chapel, the Masterpieces of Michael Angelo The Moses, Wednesday, 26 January 1898, Colosseum in the Morning Thursday 27th January 1898, the morning in the Vatican Library and the Sculpture Gallery at the Vatican. St. Peter for the last time.40 The party left Rome for India via Naples and Brindisi, Italy. They arrived in Calcutta on 8 February 1898, 
Swamiji and other monks went to Havda station to receive them. Back to India. On 3rd February 1898, the Ramakrishna Monastery was moved from Alambazar to Nilambar Mukherjee's garden house in the village of Belur, and a nearby plot of land was purchased on the bank of the Ganges, where the permanent home of the order could be built. Under Vivekananda's direction, the brother monks took the responsibility of leveling the ground, then building living quarters and a shrine. Sardananda was entrusted to oversee the office and supervise foreign visitors. He also organized plague relief in Calcutta. During August and September Lai gave a series of lectures in Bengali at Albert Hall in Calcutta, which was later published in Gittattva. In October he received a cable from Swamiji, who was then travelling with the Western devotees and had become very ill in Srinagar, Kashmir. Sardananda immediately left for Rawalpindi by train and then took a Tonga horse carriage to Srinagar. On the way a terrible accident took place, suddenly there was a landslide in front of the carriage and the horse began to run down the road frantically. While trying to gain control of the carriage, the coachman muttered to himself, I will see whether Allah protects me this time. Then another carriage came from the opposite direction around a turn and the startled horse jumped in the air. One of the carriage wheels bounced against a rock and the carriage rushed towards a ravine several thousand feet deep. The luggage was thrown off, a dislodged boulder crushed the horse to death, the coachman fell from the carriage and lost consciousness, but luckily the carriage was stuck in a tree before it could fall into the ravine. Throughout all this, Sardananda remained calm. He jumped from the carriage into thorny bushes, he hurt his feet, but was otherwise unharmed. He rescued the coachman, took him to the nearest village, and then left for Srinagar by another carriage. 41 In Srinagar, Sardananda served Swamiji until he recovered from his illness, then the whole party went to Lahore. Swamiji asked Sardananda to show his western devotees the holy places of North India and then left for Belur Math with his disciple Sardananda. Sardananda and others returned to one Calcutta in November. Sardananda was present when Swamiji installed the relics of Sri Ramakrishna in Belur Math on 9th December 1898. On 7th February 1899, Swamiji sent Sardananda and Turiyananda to West India to preach and collect funds. After visiting Kanpur, Agra, Jaipur, Ahmedabad, Limbadi, Junagadh and Bhavnagar, they returned to Belur Math on 3rd May, after having received a cable from Swamiji who planned to leave for the West again on 20th June 1899. As General Secretary of the Ramakrishna Order, Vivekananda framed the rules and regulations of the Belur Monastery and asked Sardananda and other brother disciples to implement them and train the young monks accordingly. With the vision of a seer, Swamiji knew that Sardananda would play an important role in the life of the organization he founded to fulfill the mission of the Master. Sardananda was endowed with remarkable devotion and steadiness, sound judgment and a tender heart, and also was acquainted with Western methods of organization. Swamiji made Brahmananda the president, spiritual head, and Sardananda the general secretary, executive head of Ramakrishna Math and Mission. For nearly three decades, 1898-1927, Sardananda was the chief organizer of the Ramakrishna order in its manifold activities. Sardananda was a born leader. He always considered the youngest member of the order his equal and was perfectly just and democratic in his dealings. Whenever there was a lack of servants in the monastery, he would offer to share the menial and domestic chores along with the younger members. He never judged anyone or anything without considering all sides. Hasty judgments or decisions were foreign to his nature. This of course stood him in good stead as the executive head of the order. 
everyone was sure to get a hearing from him. He never listened to slander. He followed Swamiji's instruction to allow slander to enter one ear only to throw it out by the other. 42. When Swamiji left for America, Sardananda put his mind to training the young monks. He gave classes on the scriptures and inspired them to practice japam and meditation more intensely. Once he decided to conduct an uninterrupted meditation from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Each monk was to meditate for an hour in the shrine, one after another. Someone said that might disturb the master's sleep. Sardananda replied, In Dakshineswar we have seen that the master would sleep for only a short time. Moreover, we are going to meditate in the shrine and not in his bedroom. 43. Sometimes he would ask the monks to beg for food, cook it under a tree, and then eat after offering it to the master. The disciples of the master created an intense spiritual atmosphere in the monastery that even a stranger could feel. In December 1899, Sardananda was invited to give lectures in East Bengal, now Bangladesh. He lectured at Dhaka and Naranaganj and visited the saintly Durga Charan Nag, a great devotee of Sri Ramakrishna. On 4th January 1900, he went to Barisal and stayed eight days. He was received by Ashwini Kumar Datta, a great leader and devotee of the Master. Sardananda gave several lectures in Braj Mohan College. Among them were Vedanta, the universal religion, origin and development of religion and synthesis of Janana, Karma and Bhakti. Ashwini Datta was a famous orator in Barisal. But while speaking he would move his hands and head in an effort to convince the audience. Someone observed that Sardananda spoke without moving his hands and asked about it. The Swami replied, To move one's hands and use facial gestures are great arts of oratory and most speakers use those tools to make their lectures impressive. But Swamiji did not like it. He said, during a lecture one should remove one's ego and stand in front of the master humbly and calmly. He will make you speak whatever he wants and he himself will listen to it. Thus when one speaks surrendering fully, then only that lecture carries the message of God. 44 Then Sardananda told the devotees that previously he had had that bad habit, but Swamiji had corrected him in London. One day some devotees asked him to talk about Sri Ramakrishna. Sardananda said with a smile, It is futile to try to understand the Master as long as one has a little bit of ego. The more I grow, the more I see that I could not understand the Master. Only Swamiji and Nag Mahashay understood him to some extent. We are his servants, we are just trying to obey his orders. I shall understand him when he makes me understand out of his mercy. I get scared when I speak about the Master. Even Swamiji said, unknowingly trying to make the Master great, I may make him small. When a person like Swamiji speaks this way, what to speak of others? Meditate on the Master and he will undoubtedly reveal himself unto you. Have faith. How little we have understood the infinite Master. Saying so, Sardananda's voice choked. His body became motionless, tears rolled from his half-closed eyes, his breathing stopped, and a divine beauty reflected on his face. The audience was dumbfounded. After a while, saying, Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna, the Swami came back to external consciousness. 45 Sardananda returned to Belur Math on 13th January 1900. A gentleman who had seen Sri Ramakrishna a couple of times once came to Belur to meet Sardananda. The Swami cordially received him because he had seen the Master. But the gentleman said, What good is there in seeing Sri Ramakrishna? Even the boatmen and carriage drivers have also seen him. Immediately Sardananda gravely said, Whatever you have just said to me, never utter that again. You are talking about the boatmen and others, 
Do you know what happened to them at the moment of death? What do you know about the results of seeing the Master? Have you not heard that even Pratap Hajra, a hypocrite who lived at Dakshineswar during the Master's time, breathed his last, seeing the Master? 46. In November 1900, Sardananda decided to practice Tantric Sadhana under the guidance of his uncle, Ishwar Chandra Chakrabarti, who was an adept Tantric. He received permission from Holy Mother and Brahmananda and then began to spend long hours in Japam, meditation and Tantric rituals. This sadhana unveiled to him the mystery of Shakti worship, which is the realization of the Divine Mother in all and eventually it helped him to be the caretaker of Holy Mother and to write the life of the Master. Sardananda wrote in the dedication of his beautiful Bengali book Bharte Shakti Puja, Mother Worship in India, by whose gracious glance the author has been able to realize the revelation of Divine Motherhood in every woman, to her lotus feet the work is dedicated in all humility and devotion. 47. Vivekananda returned unexpectedly to Belur on 9th December 1900, after his second visit to the West he was not well. Owing partly to this and partly to the fact that he wanted to see the work progress as quickly as possible during his lifetime, he was now and then very severe in his dealings with brother disciples. During this time no one dared go near Swamiji except Sardananda, whose steadiness and mental poise could freeze anybody's hot temper. Once Swamiji sent Sardananda to Calcutta on an errand. When he learned that it had not been done, he rebuked him with harsh language. Sardananda remained as motionless as a statue. When tea was served, he began to drink it as if nothing had happened. Disappointed, Swamiji commented, Sharat's veins carry the blood of fish, it will never warm up. 48. Observing that Sardananda was free from anger, Swamiji teased him at other times, Your veins carry frog's blood or the blood of sand fish. Swamiji knew that this noble even-mindedness is necessary for the head of a monastic order. Vivekananda passed away on 4th July 1902 and the responsibilities of organizing and managing the growing work of the order fell on Sardananda. But Sardananda always consulted with Brahmananda, the president, when making any decision on serious matters. Since 1898, Triguntita, Nanda had edited Arid managed the Bengali magazine Udbodhan, which had been started by Swamiji. In December 1902, when Trigunetitananda left for America to take over for Turiyananda, his editorial and managerial duties fell on Sardananda. To keep the financially troubled magazine alive, Sardananda planned to move it to a house in Calcutta where the magazine office would be downstairs and the shrine and Holy Mother's residence would be upstairs. Holy Mother in Udbodhan and Jairambati Only a few disciples of Sri Ramakrishna had free access to Holy Mother. Until his death in 1899, Yogananda had been the mother's caretaker, then Trigunetitananda looked after her. When Trigunetitananda left for America, Sardananda took over the responsibility until Holy Mother passed away in 1920. It hurt Sardananda when he found that Mother had no place of her own, either in Calcutta or in Jairambati. In Calcutta she lived either in a rented house or in a devotee's home, and in Jairambati she lived with her brother's family. She therefore had no freedom to conduct her spiritual ministry. It was Sardananda, though a monk, who borrowed money to build a house for the mother, which also would be used for the Udbodhan office. This building is now called Udbodhan or Mother 7's house. The publication office was moved to the new building towards the end of 1908 and Holy Mother moved in on 23rd May 1909. Some years later, Sardananda had a house built in Jairambati for the mother. Once Holy Mother said, I shall be able to live at Udbodhan as long as Sharat is there. 
I do not see anyone who can be responsible for me after that. Sharat can, in every respect. He is the man to bear my burden, 49 from 1904 to 1920, in spite of his diverse activities and heavy duties in connection with management of the Ramakrishna math and mission, the Swami poured his heart and soul into serving Holy Mother. He also looked after the welfare of her relatives, nursed her dying younger brother and made provisions for her niece Radhu's future financial security. He accompanied the mother on her several pilgrimages and often visited her at Jairambati, especially when she was ill. During his stay in Calcutta, Sardananda personally looked after her and wherever she went, he always took care of her needs and finances. Sardananda's devotion to the mother has become legend in the Ramakrishna order. Holy Mother used to speak of him as her Vasuki, a mythical snake, who protected her with his thousand hoods. Wherever water pours, he spreads his umbrella to protect me, she said. Swami Nikhilananda recorded some glimpses of Sardananda's memorable service to Holy Mother. To attend Holy Mother with her eccentric relatives was a delicate and difficult task. As she herself put it, I shall have no difficulty as long as Sharat lives. I do not see anybody else who can shoulder my burden. If anyone spoke of her going to Calcutta when the Swami was not there, she would say, I simply cannot think of going to Calcutta when Sharat is not there. While I am in Calcutta, if he says that he wants to go elsewhere for a few days, I tell him, wait a while, my child. First let me leave the place and then you may go. The Swami sometimes sang to entertain her, and when her body was burnt with high fever he placed her tender hands on his bare body and thus cooled her. Her confidence in the Swami was total. Sardananda called himself the mother's doorkeeper and he felt proud of the position. From his small room at the left of the entrance to the mother's house in Calcutta, he kept an eye on the devotees who went upstairs to salute her. It was not an easy task. Once a devotee walked a great distance to come to Udbodhan and was very hot. It was about three in the afternoon. Holy Mother had just returned from a devotee's house and was resting. Sardananda said to the devotee, I won't allow you to go up now, mother is tired. With the words, is she just your mother, the visitor practically pushed him aside and went to the mother. Very soon he felt repentant for his rash act and prayed that he might avoid the Swami while going out. He also told the mother about his improper conduct but was reassured by her. Sheepishly he came down the stairs and found Sardananda seated in the same place. He asked his forgiveness for the offence. Sardananda embraced him and said, Why do you talk about offending me? Can one see mother without such yearning? On another occasion, when the mother was ill, a devotee came to her and prayed for initiation. She asked him to come a few days later. But as he insisted, she asked him to speak to Sardananda about it. I do not know anybody else, he insisted again. I have come to you, please initiate me. What do you mean, the mother replied. Sharat is the jewel of my head. What he says will be done. The devotee went to the Swami, who fixed a day for his initiation. In spite of all Holy Mother's affection and confidence in Him, Sardananda was the very image of humility. A disciple of the Mother on one occasion took the dust of His feet, perhaps with a little show, as the Swami was about to begin His daily duties. The Swami said, Why such a big salutation? What is the idea? Sir, why do you say that? The disciple replied, whom else should I salute but you? The Swami said, I am seated here awaiting her grace by whom you have been blessed. If she wishes, she can this very moment seat you in my place. When Sardananda prostrated himself before the mother, 
as a witness observed, it was an unusual sight. He melted, as it were, on the ground before her. He showed that with his salutation he offered at her feet his body, soul, and everything. For over fifteen years Sardananda had the unique privilege of being close to Holy Mother and looking after her needs. How small he felt in her presence! Once he remarked, What can we understand of Mother? This, however, I can say, I have never seen such a great mind, and I do not hope to see one. It is not within our capacity to comprehend the extent of Mother's glory and power. I have never seen in anyone else such attachment, nor have I seen such detachment. She was so deeply attached to Radhu. But before her death she said, Please send her away. Radhu lost all attraction for her. A devotee once said to Sardananda that he could easily believe in the divinity of Sri Ramakrishna, at least he cherished that faith but he could not comprehend Holy Mother as the Divine Mother. The Swami replied, Do you mean to say that God married the daughter of a woman who maintained herself by gathering cow dung? 50. As a writer in 1909 Sardananda began to write his monumental work Shri Shri Ramakrishna Lila Prasanga in Bengali, which has been translated as Shri Ramakrishna, the Great Master. It is not only an authentic, interpretive biography of the Master, but also a classic in Bengali literature. It consists of five volumes and took nearly ten years to complete. Sardananda gave three reasons for this great undertaking. First, he wrote it to repay the money that he had borrowed to build Holy Mother's house in Calcutta and to publish Udbodhan. Second, he wished to publish an accurate and complete account of the Master's life. As an editor of Udbodhan, he had to correct and rewrite many articles about Sri Ramakrishna that were full of misinformation. As an eyewitness to the Master's life, he could not bear that any untruth be told about the Master. Third, he tried to justify the philanthropic activities of the Ramakrishna mission and also remove the misunderstanding about Ramakrishna's teaching, serve human beings as God. M. the recorder of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, had commented that the monastic disciples changed the focus of the Master's teaching, which according to M. was God-realization and not social services. Of course, M. later changed his mind in 1912, when Holy Mother visited the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service in Varanasi and said, The Master is ever-present in this place and Mother Lakshmi always casts her benign glance upon it. 51 Once Girish Chandra Ghosh had asked Vivekananda to write a biography of Sri Ramakrishna. Swamiji declined, expressing his inability, Shall I make the image of a monkey while trying to make that of Shiva? On another occasion Swamiji said, Sharat will write 52. Later Girish asked Sardananda to write about Sri Ramakrishna's divine life, his sadhana and his message. Otherwise, in the future some less adept people might present the Master in a narrow, incorrect way, which might eventually form a cult and defeat the purpose of his incarnation. There was cause for such apprehension. It was well known that Girish had given his power of attorney to the Master, who took complete responsibility for him. Some people began to imitate this and deceive themselves, because they did not understand the importance of self-surrender. Sardananda first wrote Sri Ramakrishna as a guru, the third and fourth parts of Leela Prasanga, and then wrote the rest. In the beginning of the third part, Sardananda explained the mystery of the power of attorney that the Master had accepted from Girish. Before publication, Sardananda read the chapter to Girish who wholeheartedly approved it. Once a monk asked Sardananda to write a life of Sri Ramakrishna that would contain all the stories about him. The Swami replied, Is it so easy to write about the Master? One should not undertake such work without having his command. 
If I get his command, I shall try. Some years later when Leela Prasanga was published, the same monk asked Sardananda whether he had received the command before writing the book. He avoided the question, saying, That is none of your business. 53 One day, Asitananda, an attendant of Sardananda, worked up the courage to ask the Swami if he had experienced Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Did I waste my time cutting grass, I, living meaninglessly, when I lived in the company of Sri Ramakrishna? Sardananda replied. When the attendant pressed him for details, the Swami said, Read the chapter on Samadhi in Sri Ramakrishna, the Great Master. I have not written anything about Samadhi without experiencing it myself. 54. Christopher Isherwood, the author of Ramakrishna and his disciples, wrote, Although Sardananda did not begin his work until more than twenty years after Ramakrishna's death, there is no doubt of its authenticity. Many of those who had known Ramakrishna were then still alive, and Sardananda carefully compared his memories with theirs. The great master has also the value of having been written by a monastic disciple who has actually shared the extraordinary experiences he describes. Nothing beyond my spiritual experience has been recorded in the book, Sardananda once told the questioner. This seemingly cautious answer is in fact a claim so tremendous that it silences all suspicion of boastfulness, a man like Sardananda could not have made it unless it was literally true. 55 Having the permission and blessing from Holy Mother, Sardananda began to write Shri Shri Ramakrishna Leela Prasanga. He collected all information about Holy Mother in the book directly from her. When the mother was in Calcutta, Sardananda used to read the manuscript to her as it was then published serially in the Udbodhan. When she was in Jairam, Bhati, someone else would read it to her. She commented, Everything has been written correctly in Sharat's book. Once a learned disciple of the mother said, Mother, what a wonderful book Sharat Maharaj has written. The mother replied, Yes, it needs learning and intellect to understand Sharat's book. 56. In 1925 during the Chariot Festival in Puri, Sardananda talked about the adverse conditions in which he wrote the Leela Prasanga in Udbodhan. Holy Mother was living upstairs along with Radhu, I was surrounded by devotees and I had to keep the accounts also, the burden of the loan for the house was on me. I used to write the Leela Prasanga sitting in the small room downstairs. Then nobody dared to talk to me, as I bade no Swami Sardananda times 337 time to chat for a long time. If anybody would ask anything, I would say, be quick and finish the talk briefly. People would think that I was egotistic. I could not write much about the devotees, except Gopal's mother and Vivekananda, because there was so much material to write about the Master. When the mind was ready, only then could I write. 57 The Bhagavad Gita says, He who finds action in inaction, and inaction in action, he is a perfect yogi. 4.18 Amidst the hectic surroundings and crowds, Sardananda continued his serious writing project. One day some young monks were talking loudly and laughing in the Udbodhan office adjacent to the Swami's room. Golapma, an attendant of Holy Mother, scolded them, shame on you. Mother is upstairs and Sharat is doing serious work, and you boys are making such great noise. Overhearing Golapma's loud voice, the Swami said to her, Well, Golapma, please don't give your ears to them. It is the nature of the boys to behave like that. I am so close to them, but I don't listen to what they are talking about. I have told my ears, don't listen to anything that is unnecessary. So my ears are not listening to them. 58. Sardananda had total control over his senses. Moreover, his life was extremely disciplined and he followed his routine strictly. After having his morning bath, 
Sardananda would go to the shrine and bow down to the master and then to Holy Mother. At 7 a.m., he would come downstairs and write for hours sitting in the same place. He had no time to stretch. As a result, in later years the circulation in his legs was greatly impaired and they would sometimes tremble. In between his writing sessions, he would drink tea and smoke his hubble bubble. He would have lunch at 1.30 p.m. and after that he would rest for an hour and a half. He wrote again until evening and then he would meet the devotees. Sometimes he would go to Belur Math and stay for a couple of days. In his memoirs, Swami Nikhilananda wrote about an important incident. Before we left for Varanasi in 1925, Swami Shuddhananda asked Swami Sardananda in front of me to finish the Kos Sipore chapter of the Leela Prasanga, which would describe Sri Ramakrishna's last days. He said that he had some notes, but he was not well enough to write the article. Swami Shuddhananda then said, You can dictate it and Nikhilananda will write it. He said he would see what could be done. I believe he took his notebook with him. He did not feel well in Varanasi, so nothing was done. When we were leaving for Puri, Swami Shuddhananda reminded him about the article and again asked him to dictate the whole thing to me. Then the Swami made the following. 22. Significant remark, When Holy Mother was alive, I felt a great deal of inner strength and began to write the Leela Prasanga. She died and I felt as if all my powers were gone. Then I saw Swami Brahmananda and began to feel strong again. When he died, I felt as if my brain was completely paralyzed. I simply cannot finish the book. Then he added, When I began to write the Leela Prasanga, I thought I understood the Master. But now I clearly see that the life of the Master is very deep. I was merely hovering over the top branches. The root is far beneath the ground. 59 Neither M. nor Sardananda recorded the last days of Sri Ramakrishna. Perhaps it was not the will of the Master. In 1925, when a disciple asked him to complete the Master's life, Sardananda said humbly, Perhaps it will never be completed. I am not getting any inspiration from within. The Master made me write whatever he wanted. Now when I read the Leela Prasanga, I wonder, have I written all these things? I have no more inclination to do anything. It seems that the Master is doing everything. 60. An ideal Karma Yogi A real Karma Yogi is fearless and is not concerned about others' criticism. He works for God and depends on His will. As the Karma Yogi has no selfish motives, he cannot be affected by praise or blame. Krishna said in the Gita, they are wretched who seek the results of their actions. Sardananda was a role model for leading a balanced life. His character was a perfect blend of the four Yogas. He was a Jnani, man of wisdom, and attained Nirvikalpa Samadhi, his devotion for the Master, the Mother, and Swami Vivekananda was profound, he was a perfect yogi, even a thousand problems could not perturb the equanimity of his mind, and he was an ideal worker who offered his body, mind, and soul to carry out Sri Ramakrishna's mission. Once Holy Mother said to one of her disciples, Look at Sharat. He works so much, he faces so many problems, yet he remains calm and never complains. He is a sadhu, holy man. Why does he undergo all these things? If he wishes he can remain absorbed in God day and night. It is only for your good that he is living on this earthly plane. 61 Another time Swamiji said, The Master brought Sharat for his work. As the General Secretary of the Ramakrishna Order, Sardananda had to face problem after problem. He was a wonderful troubleshooter. In 1909, Dev Basu and Sachindranath Singh, two young revolutionaries who were fighting to free India from the British, 
वर कन्विक्टेड इन द मानिकटला बॉम्ब केस बट लेटर दे वर फाउंड नॉट गिल्टी एंड स्वामी सरदानंदा टाइम्स थ्री हंड्रेड एंड थर्टी नाइन रिलीज बाय द कोर्ट दे देन ज्वाइंट द रामाकृष्णा ऑर्डर टुक इनिशिएशन फ्रॉम होली मदर एंड आफ्टर देयर फाइनल वोज दे बिकेम स्वामीज प्रजनानंदा एंड चिन्मयानंदा स्वामीज आत्म प्रकाशनंदा एंड सत्यनंदा हैड ऑल्सो बीन रेवल्यूशनरीज टू एक्सेप्ट दैम इन टू द ऑर्डर वॉज टू इन्वाइट द रॉथ and suspicion of the british government and the police but to refuse admission to a sincere spiritual aspirant simply because of his past conduct would be sheer cowardice sardananda accepted them all and boldly faced the police and the government although the ramakrishna order has never involved itself in politics the presence of the former revolutionaries brought police surveillance upon the order When Atma Prakashananda joined the Udbodhan Center in 1912 the police learned about it and summoned Sardananda and Atma Prakashananda for questioning the police official did not offer a chair to Sardananda nor speak courteously to him but Sardananda gently assured the police official that the young men who joined the order had given up all political activities while returning to the monastery Atma Prakashananda said in an aggrieved tone Swami I am extremely sorry It is for my sake that you have had to put up with an insult unworthy of your position Who can insult me Sardananda replied If my mind does not accept the rudeness how can I be insulted Have I kept anything for myself I have already offered body mind and soul at the blessed feet of our lord where there cannot be any room for good and bad honor and dishonor be at ease you need not worry on my behalf 60 to the problems continued most of the revolutionaries had been inspired by the patriotic lectures and writings of vivekananda when they were arrested the police found vivekananda's books in their homes So the British government was very upset about the publications of the Ramakrishna mission in Dhaka on 11th December 1916 Lord Karmikel the governor of Bengal made some damaging remarks during his darbar speech about the Ramakrishna mission which had a devastating effect on its activities the general public became afraid of supporting the mission as they feared that they might be tortured or harassed by the government moreover the british government had the full power to curb the philanthropic activities of the mission during this crisis sardananda stood calmly at the helm of the ramakrishna mission wishing to remove this doubt and misunderstanding on 23rd january 1917 sardananda wrote a memorandum containing 12 points to lord karmikel On 2nd March Mr Gurley the governor's secretary and Mr Denham the police chief came to Belur Math to meet with Sardananda On 10th March Sardananda was invited to the governor's house where he talked with Lord Karmikel for an hour On 26th March the governor withdrew his statement a rare event during the British rule in India The letter he wrote to Sardananda follows Dear sir I thank you for having come to see me and for the trouble you have taken to tell me about the origin of the Ramakrishna mission and its aims and objects I read with great interest the memorial which the mission authorities submitted to me some time ago I regret very much to hear that words used by me at the darbar in December last regarding the mission should have led in any way to the curtailment of the good religious social and educational work the mission has done and is doing as you i know realize my object was not to condemn the ramakrishna mission and its members i know the character of the mission's work is entirely non political and i have heard nothing but good of its work of social service for the people what i wanted to impress upon the public is this 
charitable and philanthropic works such as the mission undertake is being adopted deliberately by a section of the revolutionary party as a cloak for their own nefarious scheme and in order to attract to their organizations youths who are animated by ideals such as those which actuate the mission with the intention of perverting these ideals to their own purposes. And with this object unscrupulous use is being made of the name and reputation of the Ramakrishna Mission. I have full sympathy with the real aims of the true Ramakrishna Mission and it was this abuse of the name of the mission I wish to prevent. I hope the words I used will help the mission to guard against the illegitimate use of its name by unscrupulous people. Yours very sincerely, S.D. Karmikel 63 When this letter was published in the newspapers, the cloud of misunderstanding and the public sphere dissipated, the police surveillance was also withdrawn. In 1919, Lord Ronald Shea, the new governor of Bengal, came to visit Belur Math. Sardananda cordially received him and with all humility untied his shoes before taking him to the shrine. The governor expressed his gratitude and learned from Sardananda about the history and activities of the Ramakrishna mission. Whenever any distinguished guest or foreign visitor came to visit Belur Math, Sardananda would go from Udbodhan, Calcutta, to receive them. Although Brahmananda had a gigantic spiritual personality, when these important visitors came, he became as nervous as a child. In 1911, Madame Emma Kaaf, the famous French opera singer and a devotee of Swamiji, visited Belur Math. Sardananda cordially received her and introduced her to Brahmananda. Kaaf came with an interpreter because she did not know English well. Sardananda first took her to the small shrine built in memory of Swamiji on the actual spot where his body had been cremated. She sat down in a meditation posture and prayed before the engraved emblem of Vivekananda. Sardananda then escorted her to the Master's shrine. She knelt down before the image of Sri Ramakrishna and paid her respects. Kav said to Sardananda, Swamiji used to repeat a nice chant that starts with, Lead us from darkness to light. Would you kindly repeat the whole chant if you know it? I am eager to hear it. Immediately Sardananda chanted with his sweet, melodious voice. Astoma Sadgamaya Tamsoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amritam Gamaya Avir Avir Ma Edi Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through. When she was about to leave the shrine, Sharat Chakrabarti, a disciple of Swamiji, asked her to sing a song as an offering to the Master. Gladly, Kav sang a song in French. Her magnificent voice charged the atmosphere with joy and beauty. After she left, Sardananda made a comment. Look at the influence of Swamiji. Living in affluence and luxury, still she could not forget him. 64 Miss Laura Glenn, later Sister Devmata, an American devotee of Swamiji, had not been able to see Sardananda in America. However, when she moved to India, she met the Swami at Udbodhan. She wrote in her memoirs about Sardananda. I saw at once why he had called forth so much love wherever he went in the West. He seemed to possess an exalted gentleness, a graciousness and courtesy which made a direct appeal. His was the highest breeding of all, the breeding, not merely of manner or of culture, but of spirit. It was the outgrowth of divine, rather than of human, relations. His life was lived in a little room across the hall from the Udbodhan office. In the far inner corner of the room, beside a long open window opening on a central court, he sat cross-legged, with a small writing desk in front of him. Hour after hour he wrote articles for the magazine, a book of his own, official letters or letters to friends. He was always a generous correspondent. 
Visitors came and he would lay down his pen or pencil, only to pick it up again as soon as they were gone. When daylight dimmed and the lamps were brought, the little desk was pushed to one side and pen, pencil and thought grew still. Thirty-four to times God lived with them. I did not see Swami Sardananda during the closing years of his life, but letters from him and from other Swamis of the order kept me in touch with him, and I could discern from what was written how gradually he was drawing away from the outer world into his inmost being. As the days went by, fewer and fewer were the hours given to earthly tasks. More and more were the hours devoted to superearthly communion, until his life became unbroken meditation and he was gone. No disciple ever served his master's cause with greater fervor and steadfastness than did he. 65 Once Swami Pavitrananda talked to Sardananda about a conflict regarding work, Swami, I work but I don't feel that I am working for the master. Sardananda calmly asked, Don't you think that it is not your work? Yes, I do. It is not my work. I am just following your order. I do whatever you have asked me to do. That is enough, he replied. 66 Swami Nikhilananda recalled. I am active by nature. One day Swami Sardananda said to me, it is good to be active, but it depends on several factors. Your health must be good and you must be able to get along with fellow workers. But suppose you have injured one of your limbs, then it would be difficult for you to work. Therefore, I request you to cultivate the habit of reading. Even that is not enough. Suppose you become blind. Therefore, it is good that you also practice meditation so that if you cannot read or work, at least you can meditate. 67 The secrets of Sardananda's great success in his active life were his humility and his respect for the human dignity of others. In 1918, Umananda wrote from Vrindavan to tell Sardananda that he was coming to Calcutta to see him. But the letter was somehow misplaced. When Umananda arrived, Sardananda reprimanded the younger monk for leaving the center without previously writing to him, and although Umananda said that he had written, the Swami did not believe him. Later, when Sardananda discovered the letter, he tearfully regretted his conduct. He approached Brahmananda, then President, with the request that he should be relieved of the secretaryship of the order. Sardananda told him the whole story and lamented. He was right, I scolded him without reason. I must send for him and beg his forgiveness. Brahmananda asked him not to go so far. But Sardananda could not rest until he actually apologized to the monk for his mistake and begged his forgiveness. 68 Sardananda knew human nature very well. Those monks who were unbalanced or who had been rejected by other centers would take shelter Swami Sardananda times 343 in Udbodhan with Holy Mother and Sardananda. The Swami adopted three basic methods to make these monks work. He gave them freedom, He put His trust in them and finally He poured His love and affection on them. He was Ajatshatru a person whose enemy has never been born. In 1919, the head of a center had problems with his monastic workers and Sardananda wrote to him, Each soul is eternally free, so each person desires to be free in every respect of his life. A real leader never obstructs others' freedom, rather, he teaches how one should enjoy freedom properly even in the field of action. In another letter he wrote, the causes of friction and factions in the monastery are anger, hatred, intolerance for others' mistakes, incompatibility between the mind and the speech, meaning, taking the course of untruth and duplicity, and above all, an effort to control the monks through tricks and politics instead of unselfish love. 69 Once Sardananda advised a devotee, If you want to work, depend on God and stand on your own feet. Don't depend on any human being, even myself. 
If nobody comes forward to help your work, resolve to do it alone, even at the cost of your body. When you have such courage, strength and dependence on God, only then are you eligible to do work. Seventy stories of Sardananda's loving heart are unending. Under his guidance, the Ramakrishna mission usually took the field promptly whenever there were famines, floods, epidemics, earthquakes, or other natural disasters. Although he could not personally go to the field of action, Sardananda's heart shed tears of blood at the suffering of the people. He prayed to the Master with heart and soul to mitigate their sufferings. He wrote in detail to Holy Mother, whom he looked upon as the Divine Mother herself, and begged her to bless the people and alleviate their suffering. His outward bearing seemed stem and grave, but inside he was tender and full of compassion. Service to man is service to God. This message of Vivekananda was exemplified in Sardananda's life. He acted as the mother of the order. Whenever Holy Mother or any of the direct disciples were sick, he was always present to look after their treatment. Once when Brahmananda was living in Belur Math, he was suffering from an abscess and needed minor surgery. Sardananda accompanied Dr. Kanjilal, a devotee and disciple of Holy Mother from Calcutta and they left for the monastery by boat. In the middle of the Ganges, a heavy storm arose and the country boat began tossing violently. Sardananda was calmly smoking his hubble bubble, but the panicky doctor could not control himself. Angrily he threw the hubble bubble into the Ganges and told Sardananda, you three forty-four times God lived with them are a strange man. The boat is about to sink and you are enjoying your smoke. The Swami calmly said, Is it wise to jump into the water before the boat sinks? He then advised the boatman to put the sail down. Gradually the storm subsided and the boat safely reached the Belur Ghat. 71 This incident indicates that the knower of Brahman conquers the fear of death and that nothing in this world can perturb him. As a spiritual teacher, only a Jivan Mukta, one who is liberated in life, can be a real teacher. He is free, so he can teach others how to be free. In the language of the Gita, Sardananda was Thita Prajna, a man of steady wisdom. To those who knew him intimately, he seemed almost perfect with his deep spirituality, intellectual acumen and above all, his wonderful, pure character. He was equally great in the graces of head, hand and heart. This unique synthesis, apart from his intense spirituality, was the main quality that made him irresistibly attractive. Sardananda was the refuge of the sick, mentally disturbed, disobedient, rejected, dejected and fallen. His love for them was not mere passive tolerance, but was silently active and positive in result. The secret was that, along with loving patience, his behavior with all was actuated by his consciousness of the inner divinity of each person. Thus, like a good teacher, he helped forlorn people regain their self-confidence. Beginning in 1920 with Holy Mother's passing away, Sardananda underwent several heavy bereavements. Before she left, Holy Mother said to one of her disciples, My child, I am leaving Sharat behind. Sardananda recorded in his diary, 20th July, Tuesday, Holy Mother in peace and glory of Mahasmadhi at 1.30 am 21st July, Wednesday, procession to Belur Math via Barnagore at about 10.30 am and the Yajna, Oblation in fire at about 3 p.m. A heavy shower ended the ceremony at about dusk. 1st August, Sunday, special puja of the Ramakrishna order at Belur and Calcutta Maths on account of the ascension of Holy Mother, 72 in 1920 to Swami's Brahmananda and Turiyananda passed away. Sardananda felt an emptiness, he became more indrawn. He told the monks, Mother and Maharaj, Brahmananda, have left. 
Now you take the responsibility and get involved in the activities of the order. I no longer have any enthusiasm or inclination to work. 73 however, with Brahmananda's passing away, the position of president became open. According to the rules of the order, an election was, Swami Sardananda 345 held and the monks cast their votes. There were two nominees, Swami Shivananda and Swami Sardananda. When the election was over, it was found that Sardananda had received 95% of the votes. When his name was announced as the president, he declined, saying, Swamiji appointed me the secretary. I shall never give up that post. He himself proposed Swami Shivananda's name as the president of the order and remained as secretary until the end. 74 After Holy Mother and Brahmananda's passing away, Sardananda began to give initiation to spiritual aspirants and administered sannyasa and brahmacharya woes to the monks. Swami Aseshanandari called. Some days he would cut short his meditation in order to prepare himself to initiate disciples. Before giving the mantram, he always did some simple worship of Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother using flowers, sandalpaste, leaves and grass. He told us, it is not easy to give initiation. You will have to work for your disciples. An illumined guru has to perform special japam for their inner growth and spiritual welfare. The relationship between the guru and disciple is established by God. The real guru has to take the burden of his disciples. He works for them through silent prayer and meditation. He has no rest until all of them have become illumined. It reminds me of the beautiful statement of Christ that a good shepherd has no rest until the last sheep has been brought to the fold. 75 to Sardananda, work was worship. Once he said, All through my life I worked, envisioning the faces of the Master and Swamiji. I had no time to pay any attention to others' opinions. 76 His health began to fail, partly from overwork and partly from taking on the bad karma of his disciples. Some monks asked him to refrain from giving initiation. The Swami replied, Do not say that. I consider myself blessed that people come to me to hear the Lord's name. It is not they but I who have to be thankful for this. I am fortunate indeed that I have been given the privilege of telling them of the Lord. 77 The mark of a real teacher is that he is completely truthful. Whatever that person says, he does. Once when a young monk was going to Belur Math from Calcutta, Sardananda told him to inform Premananda that he would visit the monastery in the afternoon. A terrible thunderstorm arose in the afternoon. When it stopped, the Swami left for Belur, crossing the Ganges by ferry and then walking a few miles. He arrived in the monastery after Premananda had finished his supper and was relaxing on the veranda. Is there any emergency today that you have come to Belur in this bad weather? asked Premananda. No, replied Sardananda, but I sent word to you in the morning that I would be in the monastery, so I have come. Premananda remarked, like guru, like disciple. If any word would come from the lips of the master, he always kept it. 78 Doubt is a horrible disease of the human mind. An illumined teacher always tries to remove the doubts of his disciples. In 1925, two young scientists came to Calcutta to visit Sardananda at Udbodhan. One of them asked, Does God exist? Yes, replied the Swami. Scientist, what is the proof? Sardananda, the words of the Rishis, seers of truth. After experiencing God, they proclaimed that God exists. Scientist, there is a possibility of their making mistakes. Sardananda, is it possible that all sages have made mistakes? Scientist, I won't believe without experiencing God myself. Very well, said the Swami. Is it possible that you will only believe after seeing everything yourself?
Suppose you have never been in England. You will have to know about England from those who have visited it. Although you have not seen it, you can't deny the existence of England. Likewise, God exists. You will have to trust the judgment of those who have seen Him. After seeing God, Ramakrishna said to all, I have seen God. You can also see Him through spiritual disciplines and longing. In this scientific age, the Master came to dispel the doubts of the people by demonstrating religion. The young scientists were convinced and accepted Sardananda's words. 79 Once a disciple asked Sardananda, X instructs his disciples not to practice Japam without taking a bath, etc. Are such observances compulsory? Sardananda, the Master came to make religion easy. People were being crushed under the weight of rules and regulations. To repeat the Lord's name or to worship Him, no special time or place is necessary. In whatever condition one may be, one can take His name. The Master never gave too much importance to these external observances. As to means, adopt whichever suits you best. If you like God with form, that will also lead you to the goal. If you like God without form, well and good, stick to it and you will progress. If you doubt His very existence, then better put the question to Him thus, I do not know whether you exist or not, whether you are formless or have form. Do please grant that I may know your real nature, eighty disciple, have any realized God through mere work. Swami Sardananda Times 347 Sardananda, through selfless work the mind gets purified. And when the mind becomes pure, knowledge and devotion arise in it. Knowledge is the very nature of the self, but being covered with ignorance, it is not manifest. The object of selfless work is to remove this covering. As a matter of fact, Knowledge dawns as soon as the mind becomes pure. In the Mahabharata you have the story of the chaste woman who attained knowledge by serving her husband and by performing her other household duties. In the Gita also you find, by work alone King Janka and others attained perfection, 3.20. Not one but many attained perfection through work, for the text adds and others, 81 Disciple, I am trying to follow all your instructions, but somehow I find that I am not quite at home in my spiritual practices. Sometimes they seem mechanical, as if there is no life in them. Sardananda, if you follow the same routine every day, it is only natural that you should feel so sometimes. But then on those days, when you like any particular portion of the sadhana, Devote yourself to that and let the other parts go. In this way you may perhaps be neglecting particular practices for three or four days at a stretch. But that does not matter. When you renew these practices you will find delight in them. Before you meditate, think of the Master. If you do that you will see that whatever you do will yield good results. Sometimes think that He is in everything and He exists everywhere. That you are, as it were, immersed in Him even as a pot is immersed in the ocean. Think thus, that time's supreme state of the all-pervading deity the sages realize for all time, like the sky extending as far as sight can go. He knows everything about you. You cannot hide anything from Him. He knows even your inmost thoughts. Of course, one is much benefited by regular practice. If one practices regularly for some time every day, one gains strength and finds pleasure in spiritual practices. Disciple, I have read much about the Master. Through books, I have been able to know much about His life. Yet, when I think of His life, I do not find joy in it. Why is it so? Sardananda, to find joy in anything the brain and the heart must unite. Through mere intellectualism one does not get joy. Everything becomes lifeless. If what you have read about the Master appeals also to your heart, 
only then will you delight in thinking about his life. He will then seem to be living, 82 whenever there was an opportunity, young monks would ask questions of Sardananda either about their spiritual problems or about the Master's teachings. In January 1925, when Sardananda was visiting Varanasi, some monks asked him the following questions. B. Swami, the Master has exhorted us to make the thought tally with speech. What does it mean, Sardananda, that you must be sincere, that your inner life should tally with the outer? B. It is naturally so. Whatever we speak, we think in our mind. Sardananda, do you think it is so easy? We chant the name of the Lord very superficially. We say, O Lord, I am your servant and you are my master. I have renounced everything for you. I call you, Lord, please grant me your vision. And at the same time, we are harboring bad thoughts in the mind. It does not work. As you speak, so you must think. In other words, while you take the name of the Lord, think of Him alone. S. Dot, the Master used to say, having the knowledge of non-duality your own, you can go wherever you like. What does it mean, Sardananda, not go wherever you like, but do whatever you like? He meant evidently that after attaining supreme knowledge, one cannot commit any evil deed. How can one who has realized God or attained knowledge through discrimination, renunciation, love, devotion and purity do mischief? Therefore, after attaining non-dual knowledge whatever a person does, it must be good. 83k. Swami, we do not see God. How can we love Him without seeing Him? How can we love a being who is unseen and whose very existence is doubtful? Sardananda, act according to the instructions of the Guru. If you can strictly follow what the Guru has prescribed for the realization of God, everything will be smooth at last. Meditation comes afterwards. If one fails to meditate, one should go on repeating the mantram very earnestly. To be. Do you follow what the Guru has instructed you? Who practices even half of what the Guru has instructed? If you practice, surely you will get the result. Do you know Purashcharna of the mantram? It means a mantram becomes conscious, kinetic, when you repeat it 100,000 times a day. The repetition of the mantram in a proper spirit even once purifies the mind. Instantly the mind fills with delight and becomes blissful. 84 Disciple what is the meaning of our mantram? Sardananda, may God who is the creator, sustainer and dissolver of the universe, remove my sorrows. This is the significance of all mantras. Have faith in God, otherwise even thousands of explanations will be of no use. Pray to Him and love Him. 85 Sardananda had experienced the truth, so His words were very convincing. Many monks and devotees would come to him to solve their spiritual as well as other problems. Swami Sardeshnanandari called. Once there was a discussion in front of him about a popular religious teacher. This teacher used to have ecstatic moods, but his character was very bad, scandalous. Many people were attracted to him at first, but later on some of them, after coming in closer contact with him and getting to know of his private life, began to circulate the true stories. One of our brother monks even then expressed his appreciation of the teacher's ecstatic moods, although he knew his character to be very bad. Swami Sardananda, hearing the monk's praise, began to scold him with strong words, do not think that only ecstatic moods indicate a very high state in religious life, Pure character alone is the basis of religious life. Without pure character who can retain all these ecstatic moods? Ecstatic moods cannot endure without a pure, good character. On another occasion I asked him the real meaning of God vision or realization. Is it seeing something with the physical eyes externally or feeling something inside our inner self? He replied, 
it is the realization, feeling something inside our inner self, but you know when we see something with our eyes or hear something with our ears, we become firmly convinced about its existence. But inner realization gives us an even greater conviction of the true eternal reality. That is realization, God vision, 86 last years, Sardananda is a glowing example of a person who could keep his mind in God or the Self and at the same time his hands at work. A real yogi regards the self as actionless even while being engaged in action. Activity belongs to the body, the senses, and the mind, and does not affect the unchanging self. The Gita says, Great is the man who controls the senses with his mind and engages them in selfless actions. 3.7 Monks tend to go into seclusion for meditation, giving up action. To them Sardananda said, Remove your doubt forever, my boys, and remember what I say today. Those who will attain the summum bonum here will also attain it there, and those who will not attain it here will never attain it there. 87. By here and there the Swami meant work and seclusion. On another occasion, while in Puri, he told a monk who was not well but nonetheless was anxious to return to work in his center, Look, after doing such voluminous work in my life, I have this knowledge that we do 350 times God lived with them nothing, we are mere instruments. Everything happens according to the will of the Master. Previously I used to think that without me this particular work would suffer. During my absence who would do this work? Now I see for want of anybody, the Master's work will not stop. 88. In his dealings with us younger monks, writes Swami Asishananda, the Swami's love and forgiveness were limitless. One day when I was with him at Puri, he told me he couldn't find the beads that he usually kept in a drawer. They belonged to the Holy Mother and I kept them after her Mahasmadhi, he said. They were strung on a golden thread. Probably somebody came and took them on account of the golden thread while we were away seeing Lord Jagannath at his temple. I was concerned. I thought perhaps I had accidentally thrown the rosary into the sea along with the flowers after evening worship. I returned to the beach and searched for a long time but found nothing. The Swami consoled me. One by one everything is going away. This is the will of the mother. What can be done? Don't worry, 89 as Sardananda grew older. He could no longer personally look after the health of the sick monks and devotees, but still he showed his concern and gave his love and sympathy to all. One hot summer day after lunch, Sardananda left Udbodhan alone, which was unusual, so his attendant, Asishananda, followed him. Sardananda tried to discourage him from following. He was going to visit Khokni, a Parsi devotee who was dying from advanced tuberculosis and he was concerned about his attendant's health. Observing the attendant's earnestness, Sardananda allowed him to come along. They reached Ajra Street in central Calcutta, where the devotee was living on the second floor of a house. Khokni was overjoyed seeing the Swami but he continually coughed. He was not careful about sanitary rules. He used his hands instead of a handkerchief when he coughed. Nevertheless, Sardananda sat on his bed and comforted him by putting his hand on his head and caressing it. Khokni asked his brother to buy some fruits and sweets for Sardananda. When the fruits arrived, without washing his hands, Khokni peeled the fruits, sliced them, and then offered them to the Swami on a plate. His attendant protested, Khokni, the Swami has just finished his meal. I don't think he will be able to take anything now. But when Khokni insisted, Sardananda took a few slices of fruits and sweets to fulfill the desire of a dying devotee. He then meditated a little and took leave. On the way back, the attendant said, Swami, you should not have taken those fruits. 
I have heard that tuberculosis is very contagious. Your life is precious to all of us. Sardananda gently replied, quoting Sri Ramakrishna, No harm will come if one accepts the food given with a loving heart. Ninety within a few days Khokni died. Holy Mother used to visit Jairambati often. Many times, Sardananda would go there to take care of the mother and her relatives. Once she said to Swami Parmeshwarananda, her attendant in Jairambati, My child, after I leave this body, many devotees of our Master will come here. You should all do something so that they are properly taken care of. It will hurt me to see them go elsewhere for food and shelter during my absence. It will be good if a temple is built and an accommodation for monks and devotees is arranged where they will meditate and think of God with simple living and high devotion, away from the noise and cares of the world. That will please me immensely. 91. When Sardananda learned of Holy Mother's wish, he felt that his duty towards Holy Mother was not yet finished. Under his guidance, a temple was built on the spot where the mother's body had been cremated in Belur Math. It was dedicated on 21st December 1921. Another temple was built on the spot where Holy Mother was born in Jairambati and it was dedicated on a grand scale on 19th April 1923. Sardananda was in a high spiritual mood because his task was done. With great joy he initiated many people and gave the woes of sannyasa and brahmacharya to some monks. During Holy Mother's centenary in 1953, the front hall of the temple was extended and a marble statue of the Mother was installed on the altar in place of her oil portrait. After returning to Calcutta from Jairambati, Sardananda became more absorbed within himself. Some of the entries of his diary indicate that he was having divine communion and various visions, 12th December 1923, first day of communion. 4th January 1924, second day of communion. 17th January 1924, third vision of Divine Mother. 31st January 1924, communion poor. 8th February 1924, the circle of communion began again. 10th February 1924, Intense Communion Touching Center, Massage Repeated vision of the Divine Mother continues, which culminated on 19th February. Feb. 19, 1924, Communion, You in Me. 92 In 1924, Yoginma and Golapma passed away. They were devotees of the Master and close companions of Holy Mother. Grief for these dear ones deeply affected Sardananda and physical illness made him too tired to carry out the duties of the order. In November 1924, at the request of the monks and devotees, he left on a pilgrimage to Bhuvneshwar, Puri and Varanasi for several months. He wrote a letter to a monk, Now I am almost retired from my work. In the future if I get any command from the master to do something, I shall resume my work with zeal and I am sure that the Master will endow me with strength also. If not, then know that whatever I am supposed to do is over. 93 Sardananda was extremely conscientious. Although he felt that his work was almost finished, he thought about how to guide the Ramakrishna math and mission so that the activities and the spiritual current of the order might flow in the right direction. In 1926, he convened the first convention of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission in Belur Math, which was attended by many monks and devotees from all over the world. The convention began on 1st April 1926 and continued till 8th April. Sardananda was the chairman and he gave two important and inspiring speeches, Ramakrishna Mission, its past, present and future 1st April and the ideas, ideals and activities of the Ramakrishna Mission 3rd April. Both of these precious speeches were published in Ramakrishna Math 
and Mission Convention 1926. Here is an excerpt from Sardananda's first lecture, which was also the welcoming address to the delegates. It seems to be the invariable rule that every new movement should pass through the stages of opposition and indifference before its principles are accepted by society and humanity at large. And as human nature is the same everywhere, we find this rule displayed alike in the East and the West. The more radical the ideas of your reform movement, the more vehement will be the opposition. People will say the principles of the movement will ruin the very foundation of everything that is good and useful. But if the movement has real life in it and is based on the essential truths governing human nature, it will survive, grow and win over the hearts of people despite the opposition. Outside opposition actually helps concentrate the energies of the movement and stimulates the expression of the fundamental truths on which it stands, so we cannot say the process of opposition is all bad, after all. After a period the opposition wears away and gives place to indifference, when those who first opposed the movement begin to say that after all there is nothing so very new in it, for have we not in such and such passages of our old histories and scriptures a mention of the principles which it preaches? This is sufficient proof that our forefathers knew these principles and carried them into practice long ago, so we need not think much of it. During this second stage, the movement spreads unhindered far and wide and finds secure footing in due time through the recognition of its existence and utility by society. At the end of the second stage, we find the movement accepted by public opinion, the ranks of its members swell rapidly with this social acceptance and recognition. However, the third stage, complete public acceptance, is not to be regarded as the millennium. Security of position brings a relaxation of spirits and energy and the sudden growth of extensity quickly lessens the intensity and unity of purpose that were found among the early promoters of the movement. In place of outside opposition we find the mushrooming of internal opposition due to the varied opinions of its members and later, in place of the former spirit of sacrifice for truth, a struggle to maintain the secure social position by compromising truth with half-truths and clinging more to the appearance than to the spirit of things. If the leaders of the movement are not watchful or neglect to find remedies to check these evils, you can well imagine the result. First and foremost, the unifying bond of love within the movement slackens from the pressure of selfish motives and the members, losing sight of the welfare and improvement of the movement as a whole, detach themselves into groups with a view to improving and making permanent these separate groups that are unrelated to the whole. This process of disintegration goes on dividing the work to pieces. In the course of time disobedience to superiors, vanity, indolence and a whole host of other faults crop up within the work to ruin it forever. Hold fast to God, for God contains the stored-up energy, the kundalini, behind every movement, judge yourself and others by God's effulgent light. The spirit of rededication will make the convention a success. I welcome you with all my heart in the name of our Master, our illustrious leader, the Swami Vivekananda, and our late revered President, the best beloved of the Master, the Swami Brahmananda.94 Sardananda's speeches were considered to be the guidelines of the Ramakrishna order. The byproduct of the convention was the appointment of a working committee for the control and conduct of all the activities of the organization. The far-sighted Sardananda realized that Sri Ramakrishna's direct disciples were passing away one after another, so the next generation should come forward to take responsibility. This working committee was evidently his last legacy to the order. After that he did not take an active part in its operation. The saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely, lost its meaning in the case of Swami Sardananda, the executive secretary of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission. On his last birthday, 
In 1927, Sardananda went to Belur Math, where the monks and devotees paid homage to him. When a devotee placed a beautiful garland around his neck, the Swami 23 smilingly said, I am a doorkeeper of the mother's house. You are decorating me with a garland? Does a doorkeeper deserve such an expensive garland? 95 Ao laughed and at the same time got a glimpse of his humility. During his last years, Sardananda was in poor health. He suffered from diabetes, rheumatism and high blood pressure. In spite of these physical ailments, he spent long hours in japam and meditation. His doctor, D.P. Ghosh, suggested that he reduce his meditation time, otherwise it would damage his health. The Swami remarked, What am I to do in old age? Here sitting quietly I repeat the name of the Lord. Nobody will do anything. At least by seeing me they may be inclined to do something. 96. When one of his attendants asked him what need there was for a man like him to meditate so long, thus impairing his health, he said, The call has come. I am preparing for the great journey. Now meditation is the food of my life, and chanting his name, the source of my delight, 97. In early August 1927, Sardananda went to Belur Math to attend a trustee meeting. He greeted the monks joyfully and had lunch with Shivananda. While leaving for Udbodhan, he said to Shivananda, Mahapurush, my body has deteriorated, it seems it will not last long. 98. On 6 August 1927, Sardananda followed his regular routine of taking his morning bath, meditating three hours in his room and then going to the shrine to prostrate before the pictures of the Master and Holy Mother. On that day he stayed in the shrine for half an hour, then came near the exit door and again returned to the shrine. He repeated this unusual behavior a few times. Standing in front of Holy Mother's picture, he silently prayed, perhaps requesting her to take her tired son back. When he finally came out of the shrine, Sardananda's face was glowing with joy and serenity. 99. It is said that during her last illness, Mother once remarked, I am tired of this life. I shall you now depart with Sharat in my arms and take him wherever I go. After lunch, Sardananda rested a little, and in the afternoon he answered his mail, dictating letters to his attendant and then signing them. The last sentence of his last letter was, He who surrenders, the Master will definitely protect him, protect him, protect him. 100 After Vespers, Swami's Haripremananda and Aseshananda went to Sardananda's room and found him half reclining on his bed, struggling to get up but unable to do so. It was 8.30 p.m. He said to his attendants, Don't tell anybody. Make no noise. I will go downstairs to meet the devotees soon. 101 But he felt dizzy and laid down on the bed. His forehead began to perspire. He asked his attendant to rub his head with a little medicated oil and prepare an Ayurvedic medicine. Very soon three doctors came, examined him and declared that the Swami had had a stroke. One doctor suggested that an ice pack be put on Sardananda's head. Three kinds of medication, allopathic, homeopathic and Ayurvedic were tried with no visible results. The sad news spread. Monks and devotees came from all over India to visit him. Sardananda retained consciousness throughout, but his speech was impaired. A few days later the Swami could only smile in response to Dr. Ghosh's question, Swami, do you want to drink tea? Another day he used his left hand to drink sanctified water from a spoon. Thus the Swami passed thirteen days. Sardananda's condition was rapidly deteriorating and he had a temperature of 105 degrees. The doctors lost all hope and indicated that the final moment was imminent. Friday, 19th August 1927, 
was the birth anniversary of Shri Krishna. About 1 a.m. the monks began to chant Hari Om Ramakrishna. At 2.34 a.m. Swami Sardananda, the great yogi and beloved disciple of Shri Ramakrishna, breathed his last. At that very moment in Belur Math, Shivananda heard the familiar and sweet voice of Sardananda, Tarakda, I am going to Kashi, Varanasi, dot one zero two at noon Sardananda's remains were taken from Calcutta to Belur Math and cremated there. Life inspires life. Swami Sardananda led a pure, serene, dedicated, and harmonious life, a source of inspiration for future generations. Swami Nikhilananda wrote in his reminiscences, Whenever I think of Swami Sardananda, I remember the following verse of the Bhagavad Gita, Not the desirer of desires attains peace, but he into whom all desires enter as the waters enter the ocean, which is full to the brim and grounded in stillness. 2.70.103 In his early days with Sri Ramakrishna, the young Sharat asked a blessing that he might see God in every being. The Master blessed him, saying, Yes, you will attain it. The following incident indicates how that blessing was fulfilled towards the end of his life. One of the devotees who was nurtured by Swami Sardananda's loving care one day remarked, Swami, why do you love us so much? Swami Sardananda did not say anything. After a few days when that devotee came to Udbodhan, the Swami said, A few days ago I went to Belur Math and prostrated before Sri Ramakrishna. The Master appeared before me and said, You love all because you find me in all. That is the answer I would give today, 104.